us before. He's a friend of the dry dredgers, in fact, a member of the dry dredgers. He's also a, uh, a president of the Kentucky Paleo Society and a uh, geologist, paleontologist uh, at a, uh, it's a community college. Uh, that's my second job, yeah. It's the second job, okay. What's the first one? Uh, super fun, a geologist for super fun. And okay. Uh, he is going to uh, talk to us tonight about something that uh, has been known in the rocks of Cincinnati, although these rocks are a little older than uh, the Cincinnati, I believe. Uh, but um, they're very, very rare, at least to find decent specimens. And I know he's been uh, hunting them for quite a few years and finally found a mine. Uh, and uh, Dan Phelps, speak to us tonight on brachiosponges. We need to do a I still use slides as much as possible. I want to have a few PowerPoint talks ready right now. But tonight I'm going to talk about a really cool fossil called Brachia spongia. It's a type of hexagonal sponge, or glass sponge, and they're fairly rare fossils. Uh, I was very fortunate after many years of searching to find a really nice deposit of these along the Cincinnati Arch. Anyway, I've had some help with this. A friend of mine, Todd Hendricks, uh, this slide is from the Kentucky Academy of Sciences uh, talk we, we gave uh, you know, seven years ago when I first discovered these. And, and anyway, um, I thought I'd show you a little bit about this particular sponge. You can lower the slide projector just a quarter of an inch or so there. This is a really cool fossil sponge. As I said, it's a hexactinellid, basically a type of glass sponge. And the first specimens of these were found back in the 1830s down in Central Tennessee in Middle Ordovician Rock, late Age Rocks. And as the years went by, a lot more specimens were discovered in the Kentucky area. There was a gentleman, a Reverend Hovey, that lived in Puddles. And in a small area, a place called found literally dozens upon dozens of specimens. Over the years, he befriended um, uh, Charles Rathaniel Marsh at Yale University. Uh, the famous vertebrate paleontologist from the Bone Wars that um, is so well known for his uh, research in the uh, Jurassic dinosaurs of the American West. But um, he ended up giving most of the specimens to Marsh, who described them very briefly in a few uh, American Academy of Sciences papers in 1867. And Mar it was Marsh that came up with the name Brachia spongia for this particular sponge, meaning this armed sponge. Uh, the sponge has various nicknames, including the elephant foot sponge, because it's so bizarre. It's really an unusual fossil. But um, this is one of Marsh's few uh, forays into the field of invertebrate paleo. Uh, it's something that he didn't really deal with that much. But these were so interesting in a type of sponge that he, he did some research. Uh, later on in the 1880s, uh, Marsh's successor at Yale, uh, Charles Beecher basically put together a really nice monograph on these particular sponges. And when you have a chance, come up and look at this. This is an old publication from the 1880s. I have an original and a photocopy of the original. But back in the 1800s, this is one reason so many paleontology types collect rare books, is that some of the old plates are really fantastic lithographs. And they show the fossils extremely well. To this day, a lot of the specimens are still at Yale University. You can get on the internet and see various specimens, all, almost all of which were collected. There's a handful of specimens from Ontario, Canada. There's a small number of specimens from Central Tennessee. It's my understanding there's actually a specimen from Europe, from Scotland, in Order of Vision Rocks of Scotland. But I've never seen a picture of that particular specimen. Later on, Forsty, uh, well, actually, a, a geologist named Hall, not James Hall, but a different Hall, uh, no, excuse me, a geologist named, paleontologist named James, uh, described another specimen from here in Ohio that he, he uh, gave the species name uh, Brachia spongia tuberculata. And this is from an old uh, publication by Forsty uh, that re describes and photographs this particular specimen. This is what thought to be a different species of Brachia spongia given the name Brachiospongia digitata, meaning just it had finger-like extensions on it. 
This one got the name tuberculata because of all these little bumps that were apparently on the surface of the sponge. But I have a different idea about this I'll discuss later on in the call. There's other specimens of Brachiospongia tuberculata known from Ontario, Canada. And you see this type is much more spindly and delicate in its outward appearance. But this is found in the bulk, basically an equivalent to our lower parts of our Lexington lab cell, lower part of the Trent formation in central Kentucky. So, I want to spend a bit of time tonight talking about my attempts to find specimens of this particular sponge. It's a, like I said, a very difficult thing to do. Um, and I went through a lot of trouble. Unfortunately, I went to a physic advisor instead of a psychic. That is, um, and it ended up, um, after I asked, uh, her head exploded. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, but after I talked a little bit about my search for Brachiospongia, I thought I'd talk a little bit about the actual biology of the specimens, the actual description of the specimens, the place where I eventually did find them and what it was like, and talk a little bit about various aspects of the geology, go on and talk a little bit about paleontology, and go on and talk about why Brachiospongia tuberculata is probably still the same thing as Brachiospongia digitata. So, I have a lot of things that go over tonight, and I'm trying to make it as smooth as possible. But anyway, I, sp uh, I spent a lot of time looking for these. When I was about to graduate at the University of Kentucky, um, this is one of the first fossils I saw in our laboratory. And Cincinnati has a similar specimen. This is what one of, they pretty much look like. They're heavily silicified. This is a glass sponge. So they absorb silica very well. They end up being silicified. And they weather out of the limestones in three dimensions. And this is the typical type of what Brachiospongia from Frankfurt looks like. Uh, Dan, in front of the screen, if you see it, come on. Here. I'll project it. I'll project it with the doctor cam. So just plop it there. Right there. <coughs> but the ones we preserve, and the day I saw one of these, I said, I've got to go out and find one. Um, I started reading a lot of the literature, and if you read some of the amateur fossil collecting books, like there's one by a guy named Ransom that lists localities in every state, it says how abundant these things are. You think from reading the descriptions in the books that these were common. Even if you read the really respectable Audubon Society Field Guide, it mentions specimens from... And, um... Oh, that's beautiful. And, um... It gives you, um... An impression that these fossils are really common. I started looking while I was working for my, on my master's thesis, while I should have been working on my master's thesis, I spent a lot of time in the summer on a completely different project, trying to find a This is a 3D projection. One summer I spent Here he is putting it on a projector, um, and that machine captures the parts of, that I there. read this old, field, this old uh, monograph by Beecher, went through all the localities of Peakhead, I walked creeks, I got chased by mean dogs. I really didn't get chased by an alien, but um, <laughs> it felt that everybody, first of all, is armed, <laughs> and if they're not home, they have mean dogs. At least two mean dogs in the car. And I ended up putting little reward sheets in people's mailboxes. Got no res response at all over that. So the years went by and um, sort of passed a few other things. I finally finished my thesis after way too many years of working on it. And ended up um, working for an oil company and then leaving Kentucky and coming back. And after I started the Paleo Society, I found these new outcomes. Well, this is in the central bluegrass. I'll turn now. Yeah, that's sort of it's leaving out the rest of it. But central Kentucky is really well known for its sort of mission rocks. It forms all this rolling topography and the stuff that you have these beautiful horse farms, like I think this is Calumet. And we have areas like the Palisades with beautiful limestone cliff, cliffs of middle and uh, upper or division age rocks. And anyway, I started looking at these various localities around Kentucky. And I'll show you the outcrop here in a few minutes. But the, the specimens <coughs> there weren't apparent when the, this particular outcrop was brand new. The road was widened and deepened. And, and for years, there were no fossils to be found on this outcrop. Even, and I kept looking again and again. The mineral collectors would find fluorite veins on this particular outcrop. And it was really nice for those things. But finally, the outcrop started weathering. I started finding lots and lots of crinoids. I even led Dave Meyer and a bunch of other dry dredgers, as well as KPS people, to a field trip one time where we crawled.